Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Okay, let's begin class with prayer. Father, we continue before you in the study of this book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we do pray that we would be a holy people, uh, doing that which you want us to do and not doing that which you do not want us to do. We do pray that you would help us to have the mind of Christ uh, not only in our doctrine, but also as it applies to uh, the actual uh, actions of our life. Guide us, we pray now, as we look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last class we were looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and the lack of discipline in the church at Corinth. There was a scandalous sin there was a man who was living with and sleeping with his father's wife uh, and the church was basically ignoring that kind of a situation. And Paul has been telling them in the first eight verses that uh, that kind of sin is scandalous and that person needs to be put out of the church. So we looked at that last time, the first eight verses. Now, the rest of the chapter, verses 9 to 13, are designed to correct a misunderstanding. You notice Paul says in verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world. Now, he had written to them, and when he said that they were not to associate with immoral people, they took that as a universal kind of statement. And, wait a minute, <laughs> Corinth was full of immoral people. That's a command or an instruction that's impossible to fulfill. If you were not to associate with anyone who was immoral, what does he say? You would have to go out of the world. And so you notice that Paul had written to them earlier. Now that's interesting, isn't it? That means that we have a, a letter of Paul that is referred to here that has disappeared. Uh, we do not have that in Scripture. Now, does that pose a problem to us with the doctrine of inspiration? Uh, uh, was that not an inspired letter? It could have been an inspired letter, but uh, we need to distinguish between uh, inspiration and canonicity. The canon has to do with those books that God designed for us to have in the Scripture. And uh, we have 27 New Testament <laughs> books, and they are the books that were designed by God for us, us to have. And so the fact that maybe an inspired letter was lost really isn't a problem. In fact... Do you remember what John says about the teaching of Jesus at the very end of, uh, of John chapter 20? He says, uh, he says, many other things Jesus did and taught, and uh, if all of them were recorded, I don't even think that all of the books in the world could contain them. Were the words of Christ inspired? authoritative, divine, and yet not everything that he wrote or taught was intended by God for us to be 
part of Scripture. So we have in the Scripture the things that God wanted us to have, but Paul wrote an earlier letter. It was misunderstood by the Corinthians, and Paul is now correcting them. And he says, when I said that, I don't mean that we are talking about any kind of immoral unbeliever. If you were not to associate with unbelievers, immoral unbelievers, you would have to go out of the world. I am writing to tell you that you are not to associate with those who call themselves Christians who are immoral. And you notice, by the way, that this, this passage indicates that believers are not to withdraw from the world. Christ did not withdraw from the world. Christ was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was ministering to those who were in the world and who were immoral and who were sinful. And that is the pattern that he is giving for us. There is no Christian isolationism. We are not meant to be monks. In order to live a holy life, you do not have to withdraw into a desert and isolate yourself from the world in that way. You know what's wrong with that kind of quest for holiness? You take the world with you in your heart. <laughs> Holiness is not a matter of withdrawal from the world in that sense, isolation from the world. It is, it is having the, the, the mind renewed whereby we become more and more like Christ in our thinking and our actions. So he is saying that you are not, uh, this, this was a misunderstanding. What I said was, or what I meant was, um, not to associate, in verse 11, with any, any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. It is when a Christian a professing Christian in the church behaves in this way that the church must act. Now you notice in verse 11, it's not just matters of sexual immorality that are referred to here for discipline. He talks about those who are covetous, those who are greedy, always wanting more, those who are idolaters, revilers, uh, that's a critical and abusive person with his language. Uh, he tears you down with what he says. Uh, the drunkard, um, the, the swindler or robber. Other passages, he mentions, mentions the idle person, those who will not work, or the divisive person. Now, you notice we have a tendency to single out one or two sins that we think are particularly serious and we condemn those who who commit those sins and say they should be disciplined what we tend to do is 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 to particularly be hard on those sins that do not affect us much and then on the things that uh, maybe are sins like greed or a, uh, a, a bad temper and it leads me to start abusing something with, with my speech, if that's my, then I tend to excuse it and, and, and not look at it as that bad a, a sin. So Paul says that uh, when you have this kind of, uh, of situation in the church, that we are not even to eat with, with such a one. So he is saying, yes, that would include the Lord's Supper. It really goes beyond that, not even to eat. It means that you don't eat socially with that kind of person. He is 
to be cut off from that kind of social fellowship. Now, some have used this verse, some have used this verse um, to practice shunning. And some carry it so far that uh, they will not even sit down at, for a meal with a person in the family if they are a, if they are a Christian who has, who has sinned or gotten away from the Lord. Uh, I've known some, uh, some grandparents that have not been able to, uh, to see at their, their grandchildren because uh, the parents, their, their children, uh, the children of their grand, the parents of their grandchildren, have been disciplined by some church. And I think that we have to be careful here. You notice that Paul is saying, okay, um, there are different spheres. There are different spheres in which we live. Okay? There is the sphere of the the church, the Christian community. And he says, that's the sphere in which you are to exercise this discipline. We have other spheres. What about the sphere of the world? What does he say? He's not really talking about the sphere of the world, is he? No. But even as Christians, we have, we have other, other spheres. Um, uh, you have the sphere of business. You have the sphere of business. And you may be working for a company or you may be in a public school and you are, and the person who has been disciplined in the church may be also teaching in that school. And uh, supposing you are assigned and that other person is assigned to accompany kids on a school outing. Are you going to say, well, I can't, eat, I, I can't eat with that person at lunchtime when we're eating with the kids, when we're supposed to be there both with the kids? And I don't think that that's what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about business. He's not talking about if you are with a company and, uh, and you are, are sent on a, uh, on a business trip with another person that you can't eat with that person. That's a different sphere. It's not the sphere that he is that he is talking about here. And also, I don't think that he is talking about the, the sphere of the family. Uh, so that if, uh, if, my, if my children have sinned uh, and I do not associate with them in the sphere of the church and that, Thanksgiving time comes and Christmas comes and we have a family dinner, I would invite them and they would be welcome. That is the sphere of the family. That's, that's not, I don't think, what Paul is referring to here. So he says that we are, are not to eat with such one. Uh, verse 12, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Pharisees were just the opposite of this, weren't they? Uh, they, were, they were quick in their, in their judgment, um, but they were not, um, they were judging those outside, the, 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 those who were sinful. Uh, they were not judging, judging themselves. Paul is saying here that uh, there is a judgment that we are to practice in the church. Now, what's the problem with that verse, verse 12? Doesn't another verse come to, to mind? Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge in order that you might not be judged. That's what Jesus says. What does Paul says? Aren't you supposed to judge those who are 
within the church? Now, how do, we, how do we put those two together? Some have said that Jesus is talking about motives and Paul is, is, is talking about actions, but talks, Paul talks about being covetous, greedy. That's got to involve motives, doesn't it? Uh, I think that the difference is that Jesus is talking about, when he says do not judge, he's talking about not being judgmental. Do not have a judgmental kind of critical attitude. Both Jesus says and Paul say that there are certain clear and overt sins that we should recognize and we should judge and should deal with. Now, as far as unbelievers, it's God's business to judge those. That's what he says in verse 13. Those who are outside, God will judge. Um, but you uh, purge out the evil one from your midst. Okay, are there any questions on chapter 5? Yes. Okay, say that somebody in the church is corrupting the church um, and they're an unbeliever. What would you do in that circumstance? Because you can't give and take. So what? what if it's an unbeliever right. who is in the church, and now you're saying in the church attending well, or something like that? Like with the body. Right? Yeah. If, if, a, if a person is an unbeliever, uh, then whatever disruptive kind of influence that person is having uh, needs to be dealt with. But you're dealing with him as, a, as an unbeliever and not as a, a believer. Um, one thing I do need to emphasize, uh, and that is the attitude that we have as we're talking about this subject of, of discipline. Paul says very clearly, he says it at the end of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him. Why? So that he may be put to shame. Again, what did we say last time? The purpose of discipline is to lead a person to repentance. But you notice also the next verse, Paul says, and yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Do not regard him as an enemy, but, reg but admonish him as a brother. This is meant to be done in, in love. Uh, when you're talking about an unbeliever who is, uh, who is being disruptive and, and maybe seeking to harm the church, that person may be an enemy. That person may be an enemy. And uh, so uh, we do have to exercise judgment. There's always a great problem today. There's a tendency to be uh, too lax when it comes to discipline, and there's a tendency to be too strict when it comes to discipline. Uh, Paul is talking here about necessary discipline that is to be done in love, that is designed to restore a person who has sinned and is sinning to uh, fellowship in the church. Now this was the second problem that Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6 is going to now address two more problems. Uh, the first of these at the beginning of the chapter is uh, the issue of lawsuits in the church. And then the second issue is the issue of immorality. Now, what's the connection here? There may be a connection in uh, the 
relationship of chapter 5 to 6. What were they not doing in chapter 5? They were not judging those cases that should have been judged. What are they doing in chapter 6 with the lawsuits? <laughs> they're going to judgments, they're judging and going into court when they shouldn't be judging and uh, having these kinds of, of lawsuits. When it came to the, uh, to the secular world, you rarely had Jewish people who were going before secular courts. Uh, the Jews would have their own internal courts and they would settle matters like this among themselves. The Greeks and the Romans were very litigious. <laughs> you might think that they were like uh, our society today. Um, one of the differences between when I was young and, and, and today is that you have lawsuits for everything today. Neighbor kid uh, or comes and he's running through your yard, he trips, he falls down and breaks his arm. What's going to happen? They're going to sue you. It's not that they had a clumsy kid, it's that your grass was too high and they were tripped up over it or something like that. Uh, we live in a very, in a very uh, lawsuit uh, crazy society. And among the Corinthians, what did we say was the problem at Corinth in the church? The Corinthian believers were too much like the Corinthian unbelievers. That their way of thinking, that their practices were too worldly. They were just like the, like the unbelievers. And this is one of the areas that you see that. We have a situation here in the church at Corinth where one Christian is suing another Christian. And if you actually look at the wording of verse 1, it says, does any of you dare, dare, there's a, an emphasis on that verb to dare, dare any of you having a, a matter with another uh, go to judgment before the unjust and not before the saints. What he is saying here, and this is, this is really the scandal, uh, you have two key words in verse 1, and that is the unjust or unrighteous and the saints. The word unrighteous is the same word as unjust and you had Christians who were seeking justice from the unjust when it came to a matter of a difference of those in the church so in verse 1 we have the problem uh, verses 2 to 11 are Paul's answer to that Paul uh, is the uh, is saying what should be taking place in the church. Now, do you notice in verses 1 to 11, three, uh, a key phrase that is repeated three times? Do you notice it? If you, uh, if you actually read the whole chapter, we're going to have this same phrase six times. It is three times with the first half of the chapter, verses 1 to 11, and then it is three more times in the second half of the chapter, verses uh, 12 to 20. Anybody got it? Do you not know? <clears throat> Do you not know? These are Paul's three arguments, three arguments against this practice of suing another person in the church. Verse 2 do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Verse 3, do you not know that we will judge angels? Verse 9, 
do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, what is he saying there? He says, first of all, you are, you are seeking justice before those who are unjust. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Did you know that? That the saints are going to judge the world? And the second, second argument, do you not know that the saints will judge angels? Have you ever read that in the Bible? That the saints are going to judge angels? When he says the saints will judge angels, he probably is talking about fallen angels here and not, not all of the angels, but those who have uh, rebelled against God. Now, where does this idea come that we are going to judge the world and that we are going to judge angels? If you'll notice what Paul is doing here, he is taking a truth of eschatology. A lot of people say that eschatology is not that important. That's just a, an area that Christians debate. But Paul is taking an area, a teaching, a doctrine of eschatology, that the saints will judge the world and that the saints will judge angels. And what is he doing? He is applying the eschatological truth to this practical problem here at Corinth. Don't say that eschatology isn't practical. It even has to do with, with matters like lawsuits. Now, what is this truth that, that the saints are going to judge the world? Where does that come from? Well, both of these, that we will judge the world and that we will judge angels, is based upon our position and our relationship to Christ. What is our relationship to Christ as believers? Paul uses a key phrase, in Christ. We are in Christ. We are united to Him. And uh, because of our union with Christ, our relationship to Christ, when Christ comes again and sets up His kingdom, we will reign with him. Revelation 20 says that the, uh, that the saints at the resurrection, at the second coming, of, they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a, for a thousand years. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. Paul tells the, the apostles in, uh, in Matthew 19 and verse 28 uh, that they the 12 apostles in the resurrection will sit on, uh, on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. You will also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In Daniel 7, it talks about the, uh, Christ coming, the Son of Man, coming in His power and His glory, and the saints are given a kingdom. They are given a kingdom. We are going to reign with Christ in the future. We're not going to be sitting around, playing a harp, sitting on clouds, when Christ comes, he is going to establish his kingdom and we are going to have positions of authority and reign with him in his kingdom. That will inv involve judging the world and it will involve judging even angels. The Bible speaks of the future judgment of angels in that day. So, uh, those are his two arguments. Now, he says, look, you saints, you're going to judge the world. You're going to judge angels. And if the, world, if the world is judged by you, are you not competent, are you not competent uh, of the most trivial cases? 
probably here in verse 2, he's talking about the matters like he is thinking of at Corinth. Uh, compared with what are, we are going to be doing in the future, any of these things that we are so upset about that lead us to lawsuits with another believer, they're trivial matters compared with uh, the things that are, are really important. And if you are going to judge uh, angels, how much more the matters of this life? And so he says um, in verse 4, if then you have law courts dealing with the matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? Now verse 4 has a problem of, trans of, uh, of translation. Does anybody have an NIV? What does the NIV say? Yeah, appoint as judges, even those who are of little account. Uh, that's a, an imperative verb, a command. Uh, NIV, uh, New American Standard, New King James, ESV, they all have, have uh, an indicative verb, a statement, or particularly the, uh, the original manuscripts didn't have any punctuation, and so this can be taken as a question. So it's either going to be a command, a point, a point in this matter, those who are of no account in the church and what that would be saying is, look, if we're going to be judging the world, the saints, then when you have this kind of a lawsuit, you could take the person of least account in the church, appoint that person. They're certainly going to be more competent to uh, deal with this matter than any unbelieving judge the other way of taking it would be as a question, and Paul would be speaking a little sarcastically here and said, well, you, you, you have uh, lawsuits, uh, you have uh, a matter of dis disagreement. Uh, are you then going to appoint as judge the person who is of no account in the church? That would be an unbelieving judge. Uh, and Paul is just uh, astounded at believers that, that the believers would do something like that. And he says this, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not one among you, is there not one uh, among you, one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? Can't you find anybody in the church who will, who will arbitrate and settle this matter before you? Verse 6, but brother goes to brother, with, uh, goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. You notice what he says in verse 7? When you have one Christian suing another. Do you know what he says in verse 7? Before the case is ever decided, you both have lost. He says, actually then, it is already a, deceit for, a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. When one Christian sues another, both lose. Both lose. Now, what is Paul saying here we should do? There are actually three, three possible situations here, three, three things that are contemplated. If you have a, a dispute... And this kind of dispute seems to be a, a matter of, of property, uh, a matter of money, or something like that. 
and you feel that you have been wronged, that you really are in the right, what could you do? The first thing, you could sue him. You could sue him. And Paul says, you can't do that. You can't do that if you are a, a Christian. What's the second solution? You notice it here in verse 5. Is there not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? Can't you find a Christian that will arbitrate the case and decide it for you? Now, uh, if you do it this, this kind of thing, uh, this has to be a voluntary, has to be a voluntary uh, kind of thing. You know, there's not going to be any law court or any uh, judgment that is enforceable that could compel you to, to abide by this decision. But you have to have two Christians that will come together and say, now look, we're at loggerheads, we cannot decide, but here's another person, a believer. Uh, we respect him, we respect his judgment. We're going to put the matter before him. We're going to argue our case. And whatever he decides, we will accept. And then you have to have people that will have enough integrity to abide by, by that decision. But Paul says, that's far better. That's far better than going to judgment before unbelievers. And you know what the third alternative is? You know what the third alternative? If... If I have been wronged by you and you will not submit to that kind of Christian arbitration, do you know what Paul says I should do? You notice? He says here uh, in verse, uh, verse 7, why not rather allow yourselves to be wronged? Why not rather allow yourselves to be robbed? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong, and you yourselves rob, and that uh, your brethren. He is saying here that if it is only a matter of economics, now this can be serious. Person may have uh, have have uh, wronged you. And uh, it may have result, resulted in, in great economic loss. And uh, it, may, it may ruin you. I, I should say, by the way, Paul is not talking about, he is not talking about criminal actions here. When you have a criminal case, when you have a criminal case, that is taken out of my hands. That is taken out of my hands. That is a matter of the law, and the law is supposed to come in and, and decide something like that. But this is a matter of a civil case. This is a matter of a civil case. And uh, if I sue you, then I lose. And I lose that which is important and essential. If I don't sue you, and you have wronged me, what do I lose? All I lose is money. All I lose is some thing. I am not losing that which is, is really essential. Let me make one final comment, and our time really is, is up here. Um, this is not saying, this is not saying that uh, it is it is wrong for a Christian ever to go into court. Uh, it's not saying that we cannot, we cannot go into a court with an unbeliever. It is not saying that we cannot uh, appeal to the courts for justice. Paul did that on a number of occasions when he was beaten at Philippi uh, and they wanted to dismiss him. He says, no, wait a minute. You have acted contrary to the law and you have wronged me and you need to uh, 
you need to make a public apology. When uh, he was being in trial, on trial in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, he appealed to Caesar, or in Caesarea, he appealed to Caesar. And so it is not wrong to do that kind of a thing. Uh, I would also say that the matters that Paul is talking about here are mainly economic kind of issues. I had a friend, a couple of friends, who had, uh, who had uh, uh, taken uh, some children, foster children, from a Christian mother. Uh, she gave them to the, the, this, these two Christian couples, and these children were in the homes of the, uh, of the foster families for, for 10 years, and they wanted to adopt them. The mother had basically no relationship with the, with, with, with the children. And she, she really wanted that to happen. But her family made her feel guilty for giving up her children. And she was a totally unfit mother. But then she tried to, she tried to sue to, uh, to, to gain custody of their, her children. I did not feel that the Christian parents were wrong in going into court and fighting for those children. This was not a matter of economic loss. It was not a matter of personal loss. It was a matter of that which would be for the good of the children or the harm of the children. And so I thought that that was a situation that was different from what Paul was saying here. Question. Um, what were the two arguments again? The saints are going to judge angels. Oh, the first argument is that the saints are going to judge angels, or the world. Uh, the un yeah, yeah, they're going to judge the world. The second is that they are going to judge angels. And the third argument is in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of, of God? The unrighteous, unbelievers, are not really qualified to judge in a case like this. Yes, it's the, doctrine, it's the doctrine that we united to Christ will reign with him. And when he is judging the world, we will be judging the world with him.